Good afternoon. We're going to do the, this is the second Saturday in July, and we're going to have the topic of the day is I Got the Music in Me. And this is a continuation of images of oppression, images of resistance, because one of the tools that uh, Africans in the New World avail themselves to is music. Music was not, in, in African culture, not thought of in the way that we think of it today. Music it was not uh, an isolated practice. It was wholly integrated an, across the entire culture of Africa. So when you talk about rituals, when you talk about events, christening, funerals, church services, I mean, not church services, but, but religious ceremonies, all of that, um, music was in part, part of it. Um, so it is a holistic connection to entire uh, African culture. And one of the things uh, the enslaved people retain was their memories, was their the words was their performance and they basically recreated that um, when they arrived in the Western Hemisphere. And um, that is one of the things that enabled them to that enabled them to survive and basically resist all of the oppression that they face. So we're going to talk about that and provide you with some examples that uh, visual artists made sure that they recorded some of the participants in music and some of the musical practices that were in play in the uh, Western Hemisphere. And, and one of the things that, that I want to suggest to you that modern music has been African-infused and African-influenced into the entire world, not just uh, a peculiarity of quote unquote black diaspora culture, but in the whole world. And uh, I'm going to try to make a case for that uh, today. All right. I got the music in me. One of the things we're going to focus on three art objects primarily. This is a three-dimensional sculpture that's about four, three to four feet tall by John Faison. John Faison was originally from New Jersey and he called um, this sculpture Strange Fruit in homage to uh, Merpool's uh, song that was made famous by Billie Holiday. Um, Strange Fruit was about lynching and hanging and all of that, but one of the things that Faison kind of captured is the notion that throughout this uh, sojourn in North America primarily, that there are distinct elements that mixed together, collided, were collaged together, that produced uh, hybrids, produced offspring, produced fruit, that um, that basically nourished, I would argue, uh, African American, American, and world culture and things. So this is a we're going to focus on particular aspects of this culture. And if, unfortunately, um, if you were here, you could see the sculpture in its case, and you could turn it around and you can look at it, but. But this is one of the most interesting pieces. And again, I'm trying to find more work that Faison did because Faison was an artist that worked primarily uh, in the North Miami area. So I, I have some work to do on that. Okay, now, one of the things that I'm gonna try to uh, assert is the separation of black people from Africa was akin to the separation of Adam and Eve for the Garden of Eden. The fruit that he displayed and painted on here was an apple. And it's kind of like disconnected or fallen from the tree. And that's one of the things that I assert that, that 
it was going to be a new kind of fruit when it landed um, in America. This is a, probably a, a representation there in African culture, there was seafaring or sea goddess. Uh, Mamawata was uh, West Africa, Yemenje in the New World, but she is basically, with all the controversy uh, surrounding the Little Mermaid, um, that they were, it's really, um, let you know that before Hans Christian Andersen came up with the Little Mermaid, mermaids in African culture were, were a thing, okay? And this is like the goddess that really, of sailors, and you can see like she was not a benign goddess, so that there are, but she really was empathetic. So you can see that there's nettings and slaves that were thrown overboard and killed, she's gathering up, gathering them up. Um, this is some of the fruit that was born in North America. And you can see, obviously, the jazz band, the a band, ensemble, combo in the New World. That's, that's a modern day, like uh, a trio with percussion, woodwind, um, and brass. So that was some of the fruit that was born out in this country. And this is a, another African, which is by the artist Kuma, and it's called a hornist. And that's just a horn player. This is one of my favorite pieces because again, it packs a lot of history in this in this picture. It's by Milton A. Fletcher, and it's called The Birth of the Blues, and this is the origin of, you have Duke Ellington in the right, like three o'clock area in a big band, and it's image in the six o'clock pieces is basically rural life, and uh, it was separates Ellington with a trombone from the rural life images. You have a clarinet that separates uh, working in the fields and cotton and slavery and penal colonies and penal farms like Parkman, Parkman Prison. Um, you have um, the one in the upper left quadrant, which is basically a cotton field. And then the one at the 12 o'clock position would be pick New Orleans, St. Louis, a lot of like quasi-urban areas that give the, the origin of the blues that evolved into ragtime, that evolved into jazz. So this is a picture, and again, I'm gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna bring, when I finish, I'm gonna bring that back up so that you guys can look at that and kind of see what other images um, that 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 uh, African American drew from um, to that went into the making of the music. Um, one of the things that we we did not have on there is um, spiritual. Does anybody know what the difference is between spiritual and gospel? Spiritual is basically a folk communal song that in other words it does not have the tune and the lyrics typically don't have an, a, a recognized author okay gospel is just like regular music gospel is is written by somebody the tune is by somebody but but the Spirituals have more communal roots, either in the melody, unknown, and either in the um, the um, lyrics. The song that we're going to feature in here, the the artist is um, Wintley Phipps, and Wintley Phipps. Um, sang with the Billy Graham Crusade 
And I don't know, I'm old enough to remember like the, the person that sang for Billy Graham was George Beverly Shea for many, many, many years. And Wentley Phipps um, replaced George Beverly Shea. And he was, um, he was the featured vocalist. And the song that we're going to look at is uh, Amazing Grace. And the the story behind that, I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to give it all away, but Amazing Grace was penned um, by a sea captain of a slave ship, John Newton. And he was so affected by his experience of carrying slaves that he repented and uh, and became an abolitionist because he realized that that being a slaver was incompatible with Christian teaching and Wentley Phipps is going to just give you that history in more detail and and, and, and about the song itself um, that John Newton wrote. You can go home tonight and play almost any Negro spiritual if you just play the black notes on the piano. Watch, there are five black notes on the piano. And you can play any Negro spiritual. Just play those notes. Watch. You know that? Every time I... Come on, you remember, you learned that in school. How about this one? That's because the slaves didn't come to America with do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, da. That's somebody else's scale, okay? All they had in their musical scale were those five notes. We know it in music as the pentatonic scale, and they built the power and pathos of the Negro spiritual on five notes. When you study music, you also come across what are known as white spirituals. Yes. And they often white composers who would work with this scale. They used to call Negro spirituals slave songs, and many call this scale the slave scale. And I'm going to play for you what some musicologists think is the most famous white spiritual built on the slave scale or just the black notes. Anybody know who wrote that song? Thank you. A man by the name of John Newton, but do you know what John Newton did before he became a Christian? He was the captain of a slave ship. And many believe heard this melody that sounds very much like a West African sorrow chant and wrote the words Amazing Grace and set his words to a slave melody. I believe that song was written just the way it's supposed to have been written so that we would be reminded that whether black or white, we're all in this together. We really are. And I went to the Library of Congress and I looked up that song and wherever you see it authentically printed, you know what it says? Words, John Newton, melody unknown. Do you know how many people's lives have been changed by that song by someone named unknown who had the gene the HPLP gene and I'm going to close by sharing this song with you 
by the way, somebody put it up on YouTube. <laughs> and it is now the most watched inspirational video of any kind by an inspirational artist. I sing the first verse. I imagine the way John Newton probably first heard it coming up out of the belly of a slave ship. That's the um, what I really wanted you to get to the the spirituals um, that it was the roots of a lot of African American music, and again I'm gonna um, basically go through the other slides. I can't listen to that song more than once twice a year because I end up crying. So, <laughs> um, but this is the basis of the blues, which is the basis for jazz and the spirituals were the basis of the blues too. I mean, that's when the SARS songs and the chants and all of that started. Um, this is a, one of the most famous pictures um, African Amer by African American artist Henry Tanner, the banjo lesson, and I wanted to feature that because the banjo people have to wake up and realize that that is an African instrument. Uh, slaves made them over here, or the enslaved people made them over here to to recapture some of the instruments that they used on the continent. And one of the things that um, I really think are important in this current concept is, and I, and I, I gotta give uh, honor to my father, because he was the first person that I ever heard utter that, and, and um, what he said was, black people will not progress if every generation has to start from zero. And one of the things that he was, it was heavily weighted in his mind in terms of capital and assets, financial, fiscal assets. But what I realize is, even though he might not have 
wanted to emphasize it, it was also cultural assets, ways of doing things, ways of knowing how to go about life that if every black person has to discover it on its own, basically by the time you figure out what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go, you, the only place you fit to go is the graveyard because you, 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 you really basically wandering in the wilderness. So this is one of the, the, the most powerful pictures of intergener intergenerational transfer of cultural capital. Um, the older guy is teaching his, we assume his son, grandson, the banjo, so that he's giving him a skill and giving him something that he can probably make his livelihood out of. And um, the, 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 the emphasis of like, you have a table in the background with like food preparation, and then basically you have a black skillet on the floor um, again, related to cooking and the, the, the light that highlights the, the cloth on the table, presumably is coming from a fireplace hearth. And this is kind of like nourishment, both uh, physical, physical sustenance, but also spiritual and um, cerebral sustenance. And this is going to facilitate the intergenerational transfer of assets. So like, okay, I can't give you much, but I'm going to give you this. And that's going to serve you well in your future endeavors. So this is one of my, this is one of my favorite things. And this is one of the things that Bill Cosby wanted to buy. Uh, but it was the property of Hampton University. And supposedly Cosby said, well, how much is it? I'll buy it. And it says, it's, it's not, the painting is not for sale and it belongs to Hampton. And he said, well, how much does Hampton cost? <laughs> you know, but, but this is one of the, the, um, one of the most iconic pictures uh, in American heart history. And it is one of the most noted paintings by Henry O. Tanner, who was an African-American artist. His, his father was an AME Bishop Benjamin O. Tanner. Um, and Benjamin Tanner named Henry's, uh, the O in there was in honor of John Brown, because John Brown's raid in Osawatomie, Kansas, was where he derived the old name because Benjamin Tanner was pretty much a, in that those days was pretty much a radical. I'm just going to show you some slides. I did not collect these pictures, these images, um, based on like, oh, I'm going to collect stuff re related to African-American music. It just happened that I got stuff that I like and unknowingly accumulated a significant amount of, of, of images, artwork that were related to African-American music. This is by an artist, Bucci Upjohn. He was, he is visiting here in December for Art Basel and he has the, the rhythms, the parallels, the sequencing, the, the blending of colors, um, the, the, the frenetic pace of modern uh, African-American music. And I, 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 I love the colors in that. And this is one of the things in a different sort of palette that um, emphasizes more dancing than musical production, than, than musicianship in that sense. Um, and then this is, I love it, it's harmony because the picture does not blend it, lend itself to 
thinking of the harmony because you, it's, it's almost like a cacophony of every kind of disparate element kind of coming together. But even in this disparity, um, harmony arises. This is Benny Andrews, uh, who died about 10 years ago, who basically uh, characterizes people vocalizing, um, morning song, musician playing the saxophone. Uh, this is probably a cabaret, which is a, a vocalist and then uh, a pianist, basically like either a boogie woogie uh, stride piano, um, trumpeter, guitar player, again, a combo, piano, sax, singer, sax, he likes saxophone, trumpet. And then this is, of course, y'all who know me, this is my favorite artist, Romare Bearden, and this is one of the premier New York City jazz clubs, the Savoy. And this is a collage that he did in, in homage to the Savoy. This is for my daughter who, when she was in high school, she did a break dancing. She didn't do the break dancing. The, she did the picture entitled break dancing. So uh, again, this is, this is Bearden, um, Carolina shout, which is an, an homage to his, friend Eugene's, uh, cause he was sad about Eugene's funeral. And this is another picture of about intergenerational cultural transfer. So if we had the Tanner doing the banjo lesson, now we have, um, Bearden doing the piano lesson. And this again is a, um, a, an abstract view of what African-American music like is like, and that's called Freedom and Sound by, we know him as an actor, Bernie Casey, but Bernie Casey was an artist along with his acting career. And in fact, he was the chairman of the board for, um, SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, and I only know that because my daughter went there. Yeah. All right, um, this is the end. Any, anybody got any questions?